My name is Larry Smith, and I'm your minister for the next year. And uh, um, I, I just wanted to spend a brief period of time letting you know that I will be available to you. Uh, you can contact me through uh, the church. By I'm now connected to minister at UUC. LB.org, I guess. And uh, you can try to reach me through that. Uh, and also, you can call me. I think my number is also online. But if not, just email me, and I do tend to respond pretty quickly to emails. I need to let you know I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and that uh, I lit the candle uh, today because. My family and I went to Jurassic Quest, which is a dinosaur thing set up for uh, children in Atlantic City. It was a traveling show. And my five-year-old loves dinosaurs, so he, he could barely uh, control himself yesterday <laughs> out of it. But I just wanted you to know a little bit about me. Uh, we'll get to know each other better in, in the coming days. Have you ever been cold? I mean, really, really cold. Try to recall the coldest, most miserable time of your entire life. It might have been on a camping trip where you got caught in a hard rain and had to spend the night in a wet sleeping bag. It might have been waiting for a tow truck in the winter with a dead battery. Now hold that feeling and imagine that someone said to you, you are going to live this way for the next 300, I mean, sorry, 634 days. You will be out of touch with the rest of the world. Your family will have no idea whether you are dead or alive. And you will be hungry to the point of starvation. That is what happened to Ernest Shackleton's Imperial Transact Antarctic expedition that began in 1914. And leading at the edge, lessons from the extraordinary saga, saga of Shackleton's Antarctic expedition, Dennis Perkins tells us what it is like to survive a grueling journey on the edge of the world under those circumstances through 10 points that are important concepts in leadership. However, he, he writes this book about leadership, but I think they apply to everybody's life in general. It's not just an aspect of leadership. It's about how we live. Today, I'm going to speak to you about those 10 points because they are important to all of us as a community and as individuals. We are facing challenges neither as trying nor as hazardous as the one that Shackleton's expedition faced almost a century ago, actually more than a century ago. In fact, we have a wealth of resources and the ability to make it through our own travails and trials. The reality is that we, as a religious community and as spiritual individuals, need to remember our strengths, to celebrate them and to turn with reverence to the ideals that inspire us and the people who would stand beside us in the cold. In 1914, Ernest Shackleton and his team of 25 explorers set out for the first overland crossing of the Antarctic continent. He took with 25 men, took with him 25 men of a wide range of ages, professional skills, and as they found out later, temperaments. <laughs> Sounds like a Unitarian Universalist church, doesn't it? <laughs> they would face disaster after disaster together, and each and every one of them returned to his home. They all survived a mission that should have killed each and every one of them. Before they even reached Antarctica, the ship become, became trapped in ice for 10 months, and eventually the ice crushed the ship. 
the men that stay on a humongous ice floe for two months then decide they must drag their remaining boats across the ice to open water. They endure a mutiny by the carpenter McBesh, a one-man mutiny. <laughs> he is the oldest member of the team. By April 16th, they decided to head out in the three lifeboats and following the only option they can imagine, they take to the open sea and lifeboats, lifeboats, in search of land and find it on Elephant Island. It's a deserted island, but it's land. For the first time in 497 days, they're on land. There they realize they are marooned. Nobody on earth can rescue them, and their food supply, though better, is still inadequate. They will die there if they do not take action. Shackleton instructs the carpenter to make one of the lifeboats seaworthy for a long voyage. After considerable alterations, McNish prepares a lifeboat, and Shackleton and five other men set out on an 800 mile journey over open sea to the island of South Georgia, which has a whaling outpost. On May 16, 1916, Shackleton and his men, five men, arrive at South Georgia, but they then have to cross the island to find the outpost, meaning they will be crossing glaciers and climbing mountains. If you think this is, this is just an, a, an amazing story, it takes them another three days and nights to make that harrowing journey to the outpost, and shortly thereafter, Shackleton's men on Elephant Island are rescued. The first strategic point that enabled the crew to survive was while never losing sight of the ultimate goal, they focused energy on short-term objectives. During the time that Shackleton's crew were trapped on the ship in the ice, he repeatedly had them plan for their expedition, even though it seemed unlikely that they would make it to land. Sometimes undertaking a big thing is overwhelming, and one needs to accomplish what is possible in smaller doses. We need to take small steps in our daily activity to remember the larger vision that sustains us. The second point is that each of us needs to, at time, to let go of something, to move forward. When they were deciding what to take with them from the ship, Shackleton addressed the men and told them that no item was of any worth unless it weighed in favor of their ultimate survival. After the speech, Shackleton took out of his coat a gold cigarette case, and several gold coins. And he threw them at the snow at his feet. And that was to let people know that they were valuable, but of no value under their circumstances. And if he was le le willing to let go of things that were valuable, they could too. This is important for us. Sometimes we have to make it through the next stage of our existence to survive and to thrive. We must let go of something we previously considered valuable. Sometimes this is truly painful but necessary. Sometimes we need to let go of something cherished to embrace a new reality. The third strategy is to instill optimism and self-confidence, but stay grounded in reality. This one is pretty simple. It means that we as a community and as individuals need to believe that we live in a world of possibility. We need to believe that we can accomplish our goals as individuals and as a community because we can. The fourth strategy is taking care of yourself. Shackleton constantly made sure that people were taken care of. He learned, though, not to sacrifice overly much his own well-being because he learned that he had to be his, at his best 
to help others make it through. Do what you need to do to take care of your physical, psychological, and spiritual health. Strangely, in our society, we tend to neglect those things, and often we work on empty. The fifth strategy is that we are a team, all of us. We need to remember to turn to each other for help and support. There's a story that illustrates this point. A boy and his father are walking through the woods. The boy looks down at a rock and says, Daddy, I am so strong, I can lift this rock. And he does so. Further down the trail, the boy and his father walk. The boy finds a bigger rock. He says, Daddy, I am so strong, I can lift this rock. And with much more effort, the boy lifts the rock. They travel down the path. The boy finds an even bigger rock. There are a lot of rocks in this path. <laughs> he says, Daddy, I am so strong, I can lift this rock. He tries and he tries, but the rock doesn't budge much. Eventually, the boy looks downward and says, I guess that I'm not strong enough. You are, the father replies. You didn't use all your strength. You didn't ask me. Sometimes when we are tired and feeling weak, it is because we as individuals and as a community did not use all our strength. We have not asked each other for help. We have not turned to another and said, I need you. Perhaps we are unwilling to recognize our own vulnerability, believing in the power of our own individuality. We are stronger when we trust and support each other. The sixth strategy of Shackleton's leadership was to insist on courtesy and mutual respect. And that's something that's important in all our relationships. But you remember the old television series uh, on MTV called The Real World, where young people would move into a house together. And at first, it's all very polite and very nice. And then sooner or later, they find out who they, each one really is. And their tempers become flared. And there's a lot of conflict. They become rude and antagonistic. In some ways, this happens with every group of people. Yet we must insist on treating each other as we would be treated. Keeping this attitude of respect present was vitally important for Shackleton's expedition. The seventh strategic point is that one deals with anger in small doses. Engage dissidents and avoid needless power struggles. During Shackleton's expedition, emotions flared every day. Every day, someone would forget to close the tent flap, step on another's foot, knock snow into another's shoe. Team members addressed their concerns directly. Sometimes they had cross words. Shackleton modeled the right response, though, by letting off steam now and then. It is completely normal to live in conflict. In fact, every relationship is ultimately conflicted to some degree. Even ones that are normally very good, this conflict is always present between any group of people, or any two people for that matter. I think that every marriage has a conflict going on simmering somewhere in it, somewhere. Shackleton understood this, and understood the need to pick his battles. When McNish, the carpenter, mutinied and refused to go further, he just said, I can't do this. Shackleton listened quietly. Afterward, Shackleton turned his back and walked away. He did not waste his energy on a pointless, unreasonable argument. What other option did McNish 
have in that cold desert environment other than go forward. After weighing his options and taking a moment to cool off, McNish again resumed his work at the sled. The mutiny was averted. The eighth strategic point is simple. Lighten up. Find something to celebrate and something to laugh about. Shackleton constantly sought a reason for his men locked in a struggle to survive, to find something to celebrate. When the ship was beginning to sink in the ice and the men were grabbing at everything they could find, Shackleton jumped back into the ship to retrieve the meteorologist Hussey's uh, zither banjo. I don't know what a zither banjo is. I've tried it on YouTube. There are some tunes. Remember, he had just told the men to carry only what was necessary for survival. And here he was pulling out a banjo. It must have been a crazy moment for the people. Uh, he gave it back to uh, Crewman Hussey, <coughs> who recalled the incident as follows. It's rather heavy, I said dubiously. Do you think we ought to take it? <coughs> yes, certainly, Shackleton respond, responded. It's vital mental medicine, and we shall need it. This congregation has much to celebrate and should remember that. Sadly, though, Hesse knew only eight tunes for his zither banjo. <laughs> it seems likely that the team members knew all of them quite well after a while. Yet diversion from work and art, play, and fun are necessary parts of community and necessary parts of our individual lives as well. We also need to retain the saving grace of a sense of humor. As the ship finally succumbed to the ice, Shackleton ordered all to abandon the ship. As they were going over out of the sinking ship, he turned to one of his companions and said, we've got it in the neck all right this time, haven't we? Well, I don't think so, his friend replied. You wouldn't have anything to write a book about if it hadn't been for this. <laughs> to which Shackleton responded, by Jove, I'm not so sure you aren't right. And they both had a good laugh about it. Even at the moment of disaster, they could still find a sense of humor that most of us would be totally appalled by. And I suppose that was part of the uh, esprit de corps that Shackleton had encouraged in the men to, his, to look at some disasters instead of crying about them or uh, losing hope to face them with some sense of saving grace of humor. Strategy nine is be willing to take the big risk. Shackle did this when he and his five men set out in a modified rowboat to traverse 800 miles of open sea to find the island of South Georgia. This was a risk, but it was necessary. Never take unnecessary chances. Never be incautious unless the alternative is death. However, that is interpreted. And death comes in many forms. And all of them don't necessarily mean the end of life. If, though, the future entails taking the big risk, take it. Finally, the last strategic point related to the big risk is this, never give up, there's always another option. Even at the bleakest moments, we need to remember that we can always do something. Shackleton hit this point when he and two comrades traversed the island of South Georgia. They had to climb mountains to get to the other side of the island and the whaling station. One night, they wound up on the top of a mountain, on a glacier on the top of a mountain. Fog closed off the possibility of going down one side. 
darkness closed the other direction. It was a steep descent, but how steep was it? They did not know. As they waited for moonlight, they would freeze to death on top of that mountain. They needed a creative solution, a way out. Shackleton sat and thought for a moment and then said, I've got an idea. We must go on regardless of what is down below. To try and do it this way is hopeless. We can't cut steps down thousands of feet. It's a devil of a chance, but we'll have to take it. We'll slide down the mountain. The prospect of sliding down a mountain glacier was daunting. Giant rocks and boulders could kill on impact. Glaciers often have huge crevasses, hundreds of feet deep. If you fall into one, you're dead. It's even now, there's nothing for us, for it. Worth, Worsley, his companion, wrote, if we were killed, at least we had done everything in our power to bring help to our shipmates. So they slid. Here's how it went. We each coiled our share of the rope until it made a pad on which we could sit to make our glissade from the mountain top. We hurried as much as possible, being anxious to get through the ordeal. Shackleton sat on the large step he had carved into the glacier, and I sat behind him, straddling my legs around him and clasping him around the neck. Crean, our mate, did the same with me, so that we were locked together as one man. Then Shackleton kicked off. We seemed to shoot into space. For a moment, my hair barely stood on end. Then quite suddenly, I felt a glow. And I knew that I was grinning. I was actually enjoying it. It was most exhilarating. We were shooting down the side of an almost precipitous mountain at nearly a mile a minute. And it was very dark and we couldn't see a lot. I yelled with excitement and found that Shackleton and Crean were yelling too. Tell with rocks. This was the other plan. The one that entailed taking the big risk. The option that was the scariest one, but they took it anyway. It's the one that must be taken when necessary. They knew that it had to be done, though. The mates were relying on them, and they could not give up. When they reached the bottom of the slope, they shook hands, and Shackleton said, it's not too good to do that kind of thing too often. <laughs> <laughs> Only an Englishman could have had that response. <laughs> In my own life, I feel that I've taken the big risk only once, only twice, and neither big risk was of that nature. The first was to enter the Unitarian Universalist ministry. The other was to marry my wife. It wasn't that bad of a risk, but you know, I come from a family where marriage for, on my father's side has been bad for the past four generations, so getting married was a bigger risk. Neither risk was necessary, I suppose, but each entailed the possibility of a new life and deep love. Occasionally, we, individually and collectively, need to be willing to take the big risk, envisioning a new option, because it is necessary for our survival. It offers the only possibility of living, thriving, and loving. Today I've shared with you what we, that we need to keep in mind our ultimate goal while working on smaller projects. Let go of that which does not move us forward. Be optimistic and handle things in small doses. Take care of ourselves. Act as a team using our strength. Insist on courtesy and mutual respect. Deal with our anger and avoid petty disputes. 
celebrate. Be willing to take the big risk and never give up because there are always options. I hope this speaks to your faith in their congregation, your relationships, and your life. I share this with you because I perceive our Unitarian Universalist faith as an adventure, but often observed as the spirit of adventure is rarely lived as fully as it could be. Sometimes we need to be willing to explore boldly like Shackleton and have faith that regardless of the risks that we take, we will make it home together. This congregation is composed of people who bring tremendous gifts. It is and always has been a place of glorious possibility. I hope that you have been given through these words a few ways to move forward together and possibly in your own life. I hope that you are at the edge of a new beginning. <laughs>